All right, so it's three after nine. I'll start with a quick intro, what this panel series is about. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining our Stanford Medical Mixed Reality Symposium, or short SMMR, this time about mixed reality for surgical guidance. So the SMMR grew out of the, some of you, some of the attendees here might uh, also remember these from the large one-day medical AR workshops that we organized together with the Stanford Center of Image Engineering or SIGN that took place here in person in Stanford. Now last year, of course, we had to cancel it because of COVID. And now we switched the whole thing to a virtual format. And because we changed it to the virtual format and uh, many of you might be aware of the recent paper by Jeremy Balenson about Zoom fatigue, we try to keep it short. So we changed it from a whole day event to a series of small meetings where we always want to focus on a specific lab in Stanford that is work on maybe mixed reality. And then we have a panel discussion series with um, guests from clinic, clinic, academia, and industry, focusing on medical virtual reality and um, augmented virtual reality, augmented reality technology. We will send out invitations for our future events via our mailing list to which you can subscribe via our website. I believe there is a link um, in the chat. Otherwise, um, Steffi, you can please put the link to the website in the chat. So if you sign up, we won't send out any spam. It will be just invitations to future events. Also, you might have probably already received the message when you joined. Today's panel will be recorded. And we'll make the links to the recordings available on the website at some point after the conference. And uh, one more news section that actually probably everybody of you, or, or not everybody, but many of you might have heard yesterday. So Microsoft just won a $20 billion contract to provide mixed reality technology to the US Army over the next 10 years. So this, this really shows us this time that this time augmented reality, mixed reality is really here to stay. And as you will say, see today in uh, our panel, the medical field will very likely be one of the fields that will greatly benefit from this technology. So now it is five after nine. Now I would like to start the panel discussion. So thank you, first of all, to our, all our panelists for joining from three different time zones. So I'm glad it worked out with the time change being just a week away um, for our guests from Europe. And to talk about your clinical research and business work in the medical mixed reality space. As you can see from our panelists, say the other sense in a screen currently, we have the arc from, from the clinician, Thomas Gregory from the University of Sorbonne in Paris who already uses medical mixed reality um, on a very regular basis in the hospital. Then to the researcher, radiologist, Bruce Daniel from Stanford, who is examining new technological approaches. To then Jennifer Silva, the entrepreneur from Centiar, who brought this technology, who brought this technology from the lab to the market. And then um, to the right, to the medical device manufacturer, Christopher Hamilton from Brain Lab, that is adding medical mixed reality technology to their product line. So now we would like to start with quick five minute introductions for each of the panelists. So Thomas, if you can please um, share your screen, I stop my share and give your introduction. Yes, thank you very much for uh, your kind invitation. So uh, I'm a surgeon, I'm a, a shoulder, elbow and, and uh, wrist and surgeon, I'm upper limb surgeon. Uh, I'm uh, the head of a, a teaching hospital, a department in a teaching hospital uh, in Paris, Paris area. And I'm also professor of orthopedic surgery in the University of Sorbonne Paris now. So really a, a very quick introduction. Uh, just gonna double check that uh, uh, I can share without any issue my screen, yes. Um, you all know that we are in the third industrial revolution, that is the, industry, uh, the revolution of uh, information and communication that starts in the 1970s and as uh, any industrial revolution, it has not a linear trend, but an exponential trend with booster computer in 1980s, internet in, the two, uh, in 2000, the smartphone in 2007, and now the booster is artificial intelligence. 
And this uh, 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 revolution of information and communication has transformed any field of our life and it is transforming medicine. And if you want to figure out uh, how it transforms medicine, uh, you have five areas. You have uh, a personalized care with uh, big data. You've got telemedicine with uh, a tele expertise, tele assistance. You've got the augmented patient is uh, for us uh, orthopedic surgeon of the upper limit, the bionic hands, the hands of uh, Star Wars. Uh, you've got also, uh, of course, a simulation, but you have got also a field so-called augmented surgeon. So the technology that assists the surgeon to uh, uh, become, uh, um, to, to improve his, his procedure. And uh, it is in this other area that uh, uh, I believe uh, mixed reality plays a huge role. So uh, um, instead of uh, talking with my uh, bad French accent, I will uh, uh, show you a video. Of course, it's a sort of promotional uh, uh, video uh, uh, film by Microsoft, but I think it's a lie. It highlights all the potential of uh, this uh, mixed reality in surgery. Uh, and uh, uh, I can uh, witness that it, it really changed my practice every single day uh, now. So I will uh, show you the video right now. Here is it. Today, HoloLens 2 is transforming our daily practice in surgery. It meets two objectives, ensuring maximum safety of the surgical procedure and optimizing the quality of the patient care. For example, I can communicate with other colleagues, such as radiologists, infectious disease specialists, to get their opinion during the surgery. And it is well known that this multidisciplinarity considerably improves patient's management. The great strength of this application for HoloLens 2 is also and above all to provide surgical guidance. From the patient's CT scan, a 3D model of the skeleton is reconstructed and integrated into an application. HoloLens 2 and this application automatically calibrate the skeleton hologram on the real patient. The areas hidden by the skin then become visible. And it is possible, for instance, to define the perfect axis of the pin to be introduced into the patient's skeleton. It's like having augmented eyes, allowing the gesture to be even more precise. The scrub nurse also benefits from this application, which details each step of the surgery and the associated instruments. Easy access to this procedure reassures the scrub nurse and makes he or she much more efficient. The goal is also to collect all the data from the surgery, but also from the surgeon during all these surgeries for processing all this data in an artificial intelligence center located at Sorbonne University Paris Nord. The ultimate goal is to model the perfect surgical gesture. HoloLens 2 offers a fantastic field of possibilities that currently transform our practice every single day. Thank you very much, Thomas, for the great introduction Thanks. and the wonderful video. Thank you. Um, and now, Bruce. So, Bruce is the director of Immersed Incubator for Medical Extended and Mixed Reality in Stanford. Bruce, if you can please start with your introduction. You're muted, Bruce. Oh, can you hear me now? Okay. So, uh, oh, it's all right, Christoph, you can hear me, right? Yes, yes, we hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, I just want to thank uh, the organizers here very much for the chance to uh, speak at this uh, uh, symposium. 
and give you a little bit about the academic perspective uh, from our lab and uh, other people working in this field. So as you've heard from uh, Tomas's wonderful introduction, uh, you know, I think this is a very important uh, area of, uh, of future progress in medicine. And uh, in our lab, we've focused on a number of things. Um, we sort of see ourselves as a hub where we have uh, collaboration, where we're working on surgical guidance, uh, working on in minimally invasive procedure guidance. For example, here guiding transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, a procedure which is uh, currently done with really, without really much guidance and we think would be greatly improved by allowing the neurologist to see inside the brain of the patient that they're treating uh, to even more um, invasive procedures where maybe tools are integrated. We also look forward very much to integrating students in our work and we have uh, graduates and undergraduate students who work uh, closely together with us all the time in the lab on various projects. So some of the areas of academic inquiry that uh, I think are important uh, one is the, the accuracy of the technology we're talking about. Uh, one is really sort of the how we visualize the data. Another is intraoperative use, uh, true intraoperative use, and then also about working together. And I'll just um, you know mention each of these uh, briefly, but I think the overall goal is that uh, <clears throat> we're not trying to replace doctors, we're trying to make doctors better and make uh, sort of super doctors with our technology here. So in terms of accuracy, uh, on the left here, you can see some lovely work from Steffi Perkins and Amanda Wheeler, where they were looking at breast cancer in women, hoping to improve lumpectomy. And you can see that the area that was seen by the HoloLens was about the right size compared to a palpable tumor, but not quite in the right place. And we look at this and we realized that uh, this was kind of an issue. We wondered, are we really displaying things accurately? So we went through and looked here, for example, in two dimensions at tracing spline curves. And you can see how very precisely uh, splines that are projected by HoloLens can be traced. And then here extended that to a 3D model where um, Chris, uh, Mark uh, Fisher is working with Dave Cholock on uh, looking at plastic surgery, um, 3D prints of vascular anatomy. And you can see that they're uh, digitizing where the actual vascular print is here. And then uh, they can actually digitize and compare that uh, to a 3D projected print, which uh, you can't see, but they can see it. So if you see from their point of view, uh, they're carefully digitizing where they perceive things. So this kind of work that can be done is, is very important to be able to prove that we can actually superimpose data very accurately between the real world and the virtual world. Uh, and it's quite interesting because it reveals that the superimposition can be very accurate within millimeters, um, but we still have some issues that we need to work on in terms of these displacements that we saw here. So another kind of interesting area that I'll show you here um, is this uh, in terms of how you visualize data. So uh, one of the things that we found from that last project is the way that you represent the virtual data has some differences in terms of how accurately it's displayed to the surgeon, how accurately the surgeon perceives things. Another thing is that not all data is the same. So for example, here we're looking at um, uh, a way to display radioactivity data that's coming from medical radioactivity and with uh, particles. Uh, here we have also, as Thomas mentioned, the idea that um, we would like our displays not only to be sort of static, but to be able to simulate. So for example, in this case, we're looking at uh, planning placement of instruments into the chest for videoscopic thoracic surgery. And you can see we can simulate a pneumothorax. And this is not just in a training model of a virtual, you know, uh, uh, idealized patient. This is in a very specific patient who has a very specific tumor in a very specific place, and we think could help the surgeon understand how how to proceed. But one thing I'll show you is that um, you can see that uh, with the cinematic volume rendering I show on the right, we're still a long ways away from making our holographic images that we're working on look as amazing as you can with a dedicated GPU on a standalone workstation. Uh, so I think we still have work to be done on the rendering side. Um, <clears throat> in terms of trying to address some of those issues about misregistration in the OR that are not due to the display, but due to the patient motion. We're looking at uh, techniques for actually tracking the patient and tools in the breast. Uh, we're actually looking at being able to track flexible devices here. You can see a, a needle that knows its own shape and is properly displaying that shape inside of an opaque phantom. We also think that the mixed reality environment needs to understand surgically what's going on in the operating room, computer vision that can track the organs that are being presented and make sure that our digital data is always matching the configuration of the body during the procedure. Uh, and finally, sometimes we just have brand new data that's coming up. So here you can see, for example, ultrasound that's being acquired in real time and that data has to get into the mixed reality environment in real time to be displayed.
And then finally, I think mixed reality, as we've heard from the Microsoft Mesh uh, announcement, is a great opportunity for collaboration here. These are the two main transplant surgeons to kidney transplants at Stanford. They would love to be able to talk together and plan out their surgery with their residents uh, in a very, very effective way, maybe while they're not even in the same room together. And here, nice work from Christoph Leutz and Chloe Wong, uh, showing that you could imagine, for example, another person who's in mixed reality and they're looking at the same content that you are and have a pointing ability. Now, in this case, it's just a, a training model, but you could imagine with a very patient specific approach here where this goes, where uh, two surgeons could be operating and looking at the same patient uh, data from far apart across the medical center or even across the planet. So as we go forward, I just wanna say that it was a very exciting field. Um, I think we're looking at the evolution of doctors, uh, you know, from uh, focusing on the patient but not having many other tools back in the 1890s to being able to listen to our patients to uh, losing our way and looking at the computer screen more often than we looked at the patient. Uh, but now we're returning to an era where our full attention is focused on the patient, but we're not only seeing the patient on the outside, but on the inside as well. So thanks very much. And I'll stop my sharing here. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce, for the introduction and uh, talking about your work and the research. So now if we could ask Geneva, professor at Washington University, St. Louis, and the founder of CENTER. Thank you, and thanks for having me. This is a very distinguished panel, and I am certainly pleased to be a part of it. Um, let me see if I can put this into presentation mode. So I'd like to present something slightly different from what we've heard today. I'm going to be presenting a tool, the Command EP system, which is a system that we've developed for cardiac electrophysiology procedures. As mentioned, I am a practicing pediatric cardiologist, specifically an electrophysiologist here at Washington University. And the information, the tool that you will see here was originally created within the university. And then we went ahead and started Centier, which is commercializing the technology. The types of procedures that I do are different than what Tomas talked about. I do minimally invasive procedures, which means that I use catheters through ports that are distal or remote from the organ that I'm working on and have to use various kinds of equipment to visualize what I'm seeing. And so this is a picture of my EP lab where I use fluoroscopy or x-rays really to see where my catheters are in the heart muscle itself. I then take the electrical data, which is visualized here by these electrograms, and then recreate maps, which we now call electroanatomic mapping systems, to overlay electrical data on anatomic data to help me determine where the normal um, electrical system is, where the abnormal electrical system is, and then target to ablate or get rid of the abnormal electrical system. So in this room, which <laughs> still currently remains my lab, unfortunately. I lack really good visualization. I certainly lack control over my data. And as you can see, there is no connectivity between these things. So we've created the Command EP system. And what our system does is it takes data from commercially available electroanatomic mapping systems and in real time is able to create patient-specific geometries and overlay the electrical data on those geometries. And so what you see on the right hand part of the screen is a right atrium and the real time catheter locations and where we've mapped and where we've actually ablated what we believe to be abnormal electrical tissue. What this does is it empowers the physician standing at the table who is often the most experienced person in the room, the ability to control their own data, to visualize the data in a better way and then to connect data. So here's a little bit of what that looks like. We envision that the um, physician would wear it as they're sort of getting ready for their procedure. And then once they're in their procedure, they have their interface. And we have a gazed well interface mode of control where you can um, control things hands-free. Your hands would presumably be on catheters. You position the data where it's comfortable for you to see. So if you're working with a tall physician, they move it up or shorter look it down. And then the anchor, then the model is anchored in the room. You can then peer around the corner you can enter the model or cut into it to really understand the three-dimensionality of what you're looking at and where you ideally want to go. We can also create this, these joint sessions, something to what um, Dr. Daniels just spoke about, where multiple people in the room can be looking at the same model and really enhancing the level of communication between people in the room. You have the option to move the model or rotate it as you wish, again, all hands-free. 
Um, and you can rotate it in standard planes, the way we are usually used to looking at these models using our X-ray imaging, or in whatever free rotation you can you um, want it to be to simplify your understanding. And then of course you can make it huge, which is always a fun little trick. We then wanted to study this and make sure that we were actually doing good. And so the three questions that we really wanted to focus on was, could we make the physician more accurate? Could we, was the information that the physicians found, was it informative, comfortable, and easy to use? And then was it going to improve communication? And you've seen now people are alluding to these same themes over and over again, because I think we're coming to, this is more than just a tool to see things. So we were really looking at accuracy, usability, and workflow. And what we found was that physicians were far more accurate getting to locations in the heart using the Sentier system than they were using standard electroanatomic mapping system. And what was impressive is that this data was found within um, a small number of patients. So we were the differences were profound enough to be statistically significant within a set of 15 patients. When we looked at usability, we found that the vast majority of users found it comfortable, easy to use, importantly, easier to interpret than standard of care. But one of the things that I thought was really telling was that 87% felt that they discovered something new about the anatomy that they were working in. That's an important finding. Lastly, we looked at interactions or communications between the physician standing at the table and the person um, controlling the mapping system. And we wanted to see, did the number of interactions change? And what we found is that during navigational um, components of the procedure, that the number of communications went down, but that didn't happen across the duration of the entire procedure. So an area certainly for future investigation. Where do we think EP labs are headed? Well, certainly not just EP labs, but any minimally invasive labs, so cardiac cath labs and interventional radiology labs. We do think that augmented reality systems are going to be the first new technology into these labs. We do believe that voice-assisted control of systems and clinical decision support are going to be important as well, and those are under construction. And then lastly, we do believe that eventually there will be robots that are easy enough to use that can interface with all of these systems and improve the way we take care of patients. So what have we learned to date so far? Well, that use of mixed reality significantly improved point navigation accuracy, and that users found the system comfortable, easy to use, and allowed them to learn something new about the anatomy, that there were fewer interactions during critical portions of the procedure, and that future studies will assess whether these endpoints are going to translate into positive patient outcomes. We do predict that the way we practice ablations will be radically different in the next few years. I have the following acknowledgements. I'm not going to go through them all now, but I will mention our little humans, my favorite little people in the world, they are growing up with technology. Um, and to their credit, they are going to expect these technologies when they turn into the veterinarian and paleontologists they promised me that they will become. I look forward to seeing what their careers look like. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was a, a wonderful introduction. And then uh, we'll switch to Christopher. Christopher is from Brain Lab, so a large medical device manufacturer uh, located in München, Germany. Christopher, if you can please start. Thank you, Christoph. I'm very happy to join you. I'm actually joining you from uh, Munich, Germany, sitting in this building. And um, Brain Lab, as you mentioned, is a medical device manufacturer. We are, to maybe give you an introduction why I'm here, we are a developer of surgical navigation systems and things like spine surgery or even uh, cranial surgery, where we have developed and put on the market many navigation systems over the year. And this is where we're coming from, having uh, being in the OR, trying to show surgeons the way to approach, um, for instance, here a tumor in the brain. And that has automatically led up to our interest in mixed reality and how it can be used in surgery. We have put on the market, uh, it's 510K, take 510K cleared and CE cleared a viewer, a DICOM viewer that we've extended to uh, mixed reality. And this is, you can see it in this picture, it's a very collaborative experience. We found out this is something that comes uh, very well with customers. They actually, the capability of multiple people to see the same 3D visualization in the room. 
and also have to have point and click capabilities and go through trajectories and so forth. And for us, this is, this is a step, a big step forward, but it's definitely not the end. Where we want to go is into the OR, into developments. And this is uh, something that we've shown. I'm gonna show you some things that we've shown publicly. So this, for instance, is actually a combination of mixed reality uh, that the woman is looking at and our classic surgical navigation systems with the instrument that she's holding in the hand. So here we, we've shown this as prototypes, uh, which is using mixed reality, but also another kind of tracking. And the advantages of, of going with mixed reality into surgery, into the R health, have also been identified by, for instance, our customers. And uh, thanks to Dr. Reinacher, um, I'm able to show this image, which I think really nicely shows uh, one of the potentials for um, surgical usage. So in this image on the right, you, the person is seeing the image you see up in the right corner. And this was used, so the overlay was used to try out punctures for this procedure. And it also kind of like with Jennifer's uh, numbers here, we also experienced a much higher accuracy when using mixed reality. And this is, this is what we think the way forward um, for surgical navigation and surgery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much everybody for all the uh, great introductions and the very variety of use cases. So now we want to uh, start with some questions. So Thomas, um, after seeing what you presented about five to 10 years ago, you probably, you didn't have any of this technology. And now what really fascinating is that you said you're using it every day. So what is the biggest benefit that you think, you mentioned the remoting, you mentioned the overlay, the biggest benefit that really makes you as a clinician put on the whole lens to every day and use it during your everyday procedures. For me, when I use it for the first time, it, it was in 2017. We did a world premiere here in, in Paris. It was a, a, a potentially a tool of uh, a sur surgery, computer assisted surgery. Um, but when we put it, we realized that it was really the smartphone of the surgeon. Christophe, if you if you uh, in the morning leave your smartphone at home, what would you do? Would you spend your whole day without a smartphone? No, of course you will go back home and catch your smartphone because it's much more than a, a tool, a social uh, tool. It's a tool that helps you uh, to find any information you need uh, when you need it. But when you are a surgeon, you're, you're uh, uh, dressed in a sterile mode to avoid any infection. So you cannot uh, deal with a smartphone, a tablet or a computer. Here with the other lens, you've got a computer or a smartphone you can manipulate while you perform your surgery. So you can find any information you need in real time while you operate or in another word, if you face any difficulty, you can find a solution. You can ask another surgeon, you can ask a colleague, a more senior one, you can even go um, on internet, connect to the hospital network to find the, the patient data. So today it is the most important uh, uh, improvement in our practice of uh, the mixed reality. And of course, there are also huge potential for uh, uh, navigation as uh, it was brilliantly uh, uh, displayed uh, uh, by the panel. And beyond that, it opened a new area. If you use your smartphone, your smartphone will also collect data of how you use it. So you can imagine that one day, you will have hundreds of thousands of surgeons using the HoloLens in a routine basis. And the HoloLens will be able to capture data from the surgery and the surgeon. And all that this data will be processed in artificial intelligence uh, algorithm that will even uh, more improve the surgery and uh, the security of the surgery by monitoring the, the surgeon itself. 
So it opens a completely new area that is, to me, surgery guided by artificial intelligence. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm glad I didn't forget my cell phone and the whole lens too is also lying <laughs> close by somewhere. So don't have to go back. But that, that was, uh, I think that's a great point. And for the showing the use of this mixed reality technology in the surgery. Now, Bruce, so you are a radiologist. Why? So on the one hand, you described a lot your research. Also, why are you interested in this technology for radiology? Yeah, thank you, Christoph. You know, so for me, it comes down to like this one question that we see oftentimes, uh, uh, for example, in the breast cancer scenario. Um, you know, if, if you have, uh, if you need a lumpectomy now, you, you discover that um, the surgeons are taking out about twice as much on average, twice as much tissue as they needed to remove in order to take out your cancer. And yet at the same time, about uh, maybe between 30% of the time or 20%, 15% of the time, they have to go back again for a second operation because they didn't get it all. Uh, and, and that's because it can be very challenging for the surgeon to see what I see every day in clinical practice. When I look at MRI scans of women, I see to great detail in three dimensions, the full extent of their target abnormality of where their tumor is really in their breast. So for me, the, the, the power here is that radiology has this tremendous amount of information that goes beyond medical diagnosis. It's just not whether you have cancer or not that we can tell from radiology these days. We can tell what you have and where it is, as you've seen in many neurosurgical applications already presented by the other panelists this morning. And uh, the issue is that that historically what we do as radiologists has been very limited. We, we see these beautiful images and then we reduce it to a written report that we give to Tomas. And, and then he tries to figure out what kind of operation to do. And that's crazy to me, right? But what I think we need to be thinking is like, how do we get this very rich content and the interpretation that goes with it into the hands of our procedural colleagues so that they can really do the very best for their patients and reduce over excessive operations and yet same time reduce operations that have to be repeated because things were missed. And I think one key of that, as I mentioned, is the power of radiological images uh, that is currently under tapped. Thank you very much. Yeah. So yeah, that, that was very interesting. What I also really liked is uh, when you talk about uh, having all this data and presenting it um, directly. Shenava, you showed this one image where you had all these different screens up in the background, all trying to gather all this data and somehow make it accessible um, to the clinician. When was your sort of aha moment where you thought, okay, this is a technology that I'm not just doing research about, this is actually something we can commercialize because it will be very useful for a large number of clinicians. Yeah, you know, I think that as with most people who started working in medical mixed reality, we, uh, my co-founder is also my husband, Jonathan Silva, who's a professor of engineering here at Washington University. And we first saw this as a, visu as a straight visualization tool. And it was as soon as we started actually playing with it and actually developing, we realized that it was actually a much richer tool um, it, it was essentially becoming a data aggregation system, right? It was going to be it was going to be my command center. It was going to really let me start being in charge of all of these various data streams. Um, and I think that interventional radiology or these minimally invasive spaces, this image guided therapy space, if you will, is is um, is full of these various data streams coming into a single person. We don't have the the luxury of the patient on the table, open and ready to look at. We're bombarded constantly. Um, my friend used a very good um, analogy the other day. He said, it's like being a conductor in a symphony, right? I have all of these different pieces going around and I need only one piece at a certain time or maybe I need two pieces at a certain time and then I need to fade these into the background. And this is gonna allow us to do that. We realized that pretty early, I have to say. Um, when did we realize commercial potential? We, I, I have to be honest, we were told that there was commercial potential. We didn't initially approach this as a commercial tool. We were taking a, a pretty routine academic um, path on this. And we were pretty fortunate that our Office of Technology Management, our tech transfer office, whatever you call it, at, your, at whatever institution that you're at, that they very quickly said, you know, we think that this has commercial potential. And we were fortunate to have people in industry who said very quickly, please make sure you protect your idea, protect yourselves, and um, got really good guidance early on on how to do that. 
But I agree, just to echo what Tomas said, this notion of this intelligent edge and mixed reality being this tool to provide surgeons, to provide um, physicians an intelligent edge, I think that that's critical. And I think that's where we're gonna find the real value in these systems. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So if we look at Brain Lab, Christopher, you as a, like this huge company who is already selling a lot of medical devices um, to surgeon even before mixed reality, um, you also probably at some point then realize, okay, th this is a technology we have to look into and present to our customers. And um, what is it that Brain Lab thinks is so important about mixed reality technology so that you have your complete new product lineup in that space? So I'd say that Brain Lab actually thought about the technology very early on. I'd say almost 15 years ago, long before we really had these products, we looked at using computers to get a kind of augmented reality view. Uh, and so the, the need or the, the use case was there before we had the technology. And then when we saw that the technology was coming, when the, the, the glasses were coming on the market, it was more of a feeling like, oh, finally we, we have uh, the right hardware that we need to create um, solutions that we want to have. So I'd say that we, we first had the use case and then when the technology come, it was um, obvious for us to jump on that train and explore their capabilities. Okay, thank you. So right now we had talked a lot about what you um, guys think about the technology, why it is important for you. It would be also interesting to hear, okay, what do the others think about it? For example, Geneva, from your experience, um, if you look at, for example, the patients, how the patients and the clinicians and um, other stakeholders react to this technology. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Sure, so I, in our experience, the physicians have reacted universally positive to it, um, mostly because we recognize the limitations of our field and we're ex most people are really excited to be on the forefront of that. And the, the nice thing about most minimally invasive procedure, uh, minimally invasive specialties, certainly for cardiac electrophysiology is that we're young enough as a group of interventionalists that the technology piece doesn't frighten us, it kind of excites us. I think for me, what's been really interesting and very helpful is the patient experience. So as we were doing our clinical study, one of the things that we would do after patients were consented and wanted to participate in the procedure, we would show them a demo of what, a, what their kind of procedure would look like. And the faces on these kids was priceless. They got it for the first time. And I've been doing this a bit and consenting lots and lots of patients. They actually understood what we were doing and they would, and they would actually tell me, stop talking, I'm focusing on this now. And they would get so involved and the parents as well really viscerally understood what we were doing in a way that we hadn't seen before. This is a whole area for exploration that I think would be very interesting. I'm curious as to what Thomas's experience has been with this. Yes, Thomas, can you? Um, on that. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, the, the, this revolution of information and communication has completely changed the relationship between doctors and patients. Okay, the patient wants to be partner uh, of his treatment, but how can he be partner uh, uh, when he, he go for an operation? In fact, he rely on technology. So it's a patient that push the surgeon to, to become more and more digital. Uh, they don't want to, be, to, to face a, a surgeon's artist. They want to, to, to face uh, uh, an augmented surgeon that has uh, technologies that will standardize the procedure. It's a little bit like uh, uh, when you take a plane, uh, uh, Christophe, uh, you will not choose the plane pilot because you know he has a cockpit full of technology. Uh, uh, and uh, that's what the patient wants. And that's why uh, they push uh, uh, for, for, for having a, a surgical um, uh, guidance and so on. And what I say to my colleagues when they are reluctant to the technology is, is that uh, uh, I don't think that technology will change, uh, uh, take the place of surgeons, but surgeons that use technology will replace surgeons that will not use technology. So, so it's, uh, 
is it square? Yeah, okay, Bruce, sorry. Well, I thought I might add just a quick comment too about this, what patients think. Well, one thing is that uh, all that data can be overwhelming. And, and I see this as also the evolution from the smartphone where there used to be 50 buttons all over your phone and a little screen to a phone now that maybe has no buttons. Uh, it's the same thing. We're even doing a better job of integrating it. And then that has tremendous value. We take our data and we give it to the patient as Jennifer has to look at. And when a, when a woman can see her own breast cancer for the first time and now has this like, oh, that's the enemy I'm facing moment. It's extremely powerful. And I don't know that we can capture that in a way that shows better outcomes for the patient, but it's an amazing moment when people understand what it is they're facing in a very intuitive way because these systems can provide all that complex data being reduced into something that feels very tangible. Um, so yeah, I think that there is uh, something that has to be studied here and I don't know how to study it exactly, but it's very powerful. So we heard a lot about uh, how this technology already at the current stage is useful and what is also, I think, very good. Right now we are away from the stage where you always have to awkwardly like use your finger tap but you can actually really uh, more naturally interact with the um, content. But now I would like to hear your opinions. Uh, perhaps let's start uh, with Christoph on that. If you look at the current stage of the technology, what are things that work very well and what are still some limitations that need to improve over the next years? So in general, the state is actually quite good. I think if you think of mixed reality in the medical field being used, we are much, uh, much f further than if you think of using it like a consumer device. You won't see many people walking around with these on the street, but the capabilities of the devices that we have so far for use, for instance, for how we use them for viewing, or I think even going into surgery, they're quite advanced actually. And uh, I think that's something important to keep in mind. Um, there are things that, some things work very good like controllers, uh, having uh, spatial audio. There are some things with the headsets that really improve the experience, of course, the stereoscopic viewing. And if you, if you think things to improve, there, of course, you can always wish for more powerful computer and, and smaller glasses. Uh, so that's definitely something. And also the, well, kind of maybe reducing the barrier between the people wearing headsets and the people not wearing headsets. I think that's also something that is we should we would like to see that well maybe them getting physically smaller see that barrier reduced that that's a very interesting point yeah and then bruce you mentioned in your um, presentation about uh, the research you're doing you're looking at alignments and alignment accuracies what are some technological challenges in that space well there's, there's a lot of uh, challenges there because different people actually use different cues at neurologically to understand depth and the systems may not always be optimized for all users. But to go back to your other question too about the main limitations of the technology that I see, two main ones for guiding surgery. One, um, the systems all have a focal fixed optical focal length that's at least one to two meters out. And yet we're working at our hands distance most of the time for surgery. And uh, so we need some solution there. And that's a hardware problem that I haven't seen fixed yet. Another one is a kind of this idea of occlusion. So sometimes we wanna actually turn off the body so we can project our content inside of it. Uh, and sometimes we want our content to go away when it's obscured by parts of the body or the surgical hands or the tools, et cetera. And so that's an area that I think there's ripe for work that hasn't been solved. But I would echo what uh, Christopher said though, which is despite those problems, it's amazingly powerful technology right now. And so there's also, if you look at the technology and how complicated it is also to create some of these headsets, there are sort of these two pathways how this could evolve. So it's, I think it's at Centia, Geneva using the whole lens, right? And um, Brain Lab, Christopher using the magic leap. Thomas, you're using the whole lens and um, Bruce is using yes. both, right? But um, there's also the possibility we look, for example, at Augmedics. Augmedics, I think just this week, they received funding of $36 million and they have, for example, their own headset. So they made their own hardware. What path do you think it will go? Will it be rather similar to what you're doing at BrainUp Center AR that you use the um, off-the-shelf hardware devices um, of the large headset manufacturers or are there, will there be many medical companies that do their own devices? Perhaps Jennifer, if you want to chime in on that. 
I, I'm happy to start. I'm curious to see where this conversation goes. I think for Sentier, we, we pride ourselves on being a software company and partnering with hardware companies that can do this um, better with an efficiency and with a brain power that we can't necessarily bring to that table. Ours really is in that medical device space. Um, so, you know, I will say, I think that um, Microsoft and certainly from what I've seen of Magic Leap, they're, they've really set the standard very high, which, and that, that high barrier may make it more difficult for smaller companies to get into that market. Um, the other piece is that there's, there's a very practical thing to consider, which is cost. It is going to cost a lot to make these headsets and being able to pick one up off the shelf. Yes, certainly that has its own set of limitations, but it, it really does lower the barrier to entry. And I think that's one of the reasons we've seen so much research done in the medical space is because you can literally go online and order yourself a couple hollow lenses and off you are to the races. Yeah. That's a very good point. So perhaps, uh, Christopher, what do you think? So you all have this uh, very close partnership with Magic Leap. I suppose that works well for you. Can you can you tell a bit about that? And also, can you so tell us you... when the how the Magic Leap Two is is, is doing and what the end of it is? <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> maybe I answer your first. Uh, so the other question you asked about like custom made headsets versus commercial headsets. That's a very good question and. Um, I think there might be room for both down the road, but there is something um, I maybe echo what Jennifer said. That's that the commercial headsets, if you imagine them maybe being more pervasive in common use, maybe they are becoming more common as uh, similar to smartphones, then they will also set the kind of expectations with surgeons and others using these headsets for medical purposes. And it will be very difficult for the custom made headsets to keep up, I think, with the pace of development that you're going to see with these large uh, consumer uh, device headsets. But on the other hand, there might be some, um, some parts of surgery where these headsets, the, the custom made headsets are actually at an advantage. Okay. Can I make a, one quick comment? Just, Please, uh, yeah. For example, some surgery is done with a microscope, right? That's so that's a great example of where a custom solution is being added as opposed to the headset solution. But I agree, we, we with the headsets, the commercial ones, we ride on the coattails of a huge industrial gaming development um, invest, investment, and we can leverage an enormous amount of, of, of you know, future proofing that, that is being paid for by other people. <laughs> so that's good. Like we one... did with the graphic cards. Exactly. I do think that, you know, they there may be focuses then for those commercial entities, right? They may be more focused on enterprise versus medical or something like that. And so I think that if you're, you know, likely if you're on this call, you have the creativity to take things that are not necessarily designed for your purpose and bend them to your will a little bit. And I think that's where things are gonna start getting interesting. And you might take something off the shelf and make some modifications to it. And, you know, then your creativity is really the only thing that limits you. That's possible. Like for example, the US Army uses this so-called IVIS, which is a modified whole lens tool with thermal sensors. It's possible, yeah, that you use sort of the uh, core structure of an existing one and modify it. Now there is like, uh, I have another question, a little bit dif different. Um, Thomas, you recently did the whole surgery event where you had these remote surgeries with, I don't know, 12 countries all over the world. So you have experience of uh, how different countries react to this technology. Are there any big experience? We also have now two guests here from Europe, two from the US. Any experiences where you think, how is this technology received differently, for example, in Europe and in the US or in France and Germany and the US? Yeah, I think it was generally a, a very well perceived technology. Uh, and so it was, uh, yes, 24 hour of holographic surgery, 12 surgery performed uh, uh, in 12 uh, countries and, uh, and display during this 24 hours. And uh, we have only good feedback, but I would say that the countries where perhaps uh, the necessity of uh, tele-expertise and tele-assistance is the most important, uh, have perceived the technology with uh, the, the biggest uh, interest. 
when the need when you have the need for uh, um, in Europe in US uh, uh, we have a, a long lasting story uh, of well trained surgeons but you have a, a country in, in the world where uh, they have just created elaborated the healthcare system for the population and suddenly they need hundred more surgeons to treat the patients. And it is in those countries that this technology is the most perceived because then the new surgeons, with less experience can uh, uh, contact uh, a more experienced one uh, that is uh, uh, remotely from uh, the, the, his place. So yeah, that's my uh, That's a wonderful point. About. So and this is something we should do a whole uh, the panel about like how this distributed expertise problem that is solved by uh, remoting and remote experience and mixed reality. Um, and I, I just want to, to add one thing, uh, Christophe, about yeah. that is that uh, so far the technology was perceived I, uh, as, a, a, you, know, a, a, um, you know, rich countries uh, a surgery. Uh, um, because mixed reality has been elaborated for another field that medicines uh, it is relatively cheap. Uh, a robot, it's $100,000. Uh, uh, HoloLens is uh, uh, $4,000 with the, with, the, with, with the license. So it's tools that will generalize and democratize uh, 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 digital technology uh, all, all over the world. Yeah, thank you very much. So since we are um, getting close to 10, I, there's an other, another important question I want to ask everybody here. Um, and you can sort of also choose which question, question you want to answer. That's why we'll answer, uh, ask you multiple questions and then you um, choose what you will address here. So what would your ideal AR device uh, look like? Or are there any things that you really hope develop in the field, for example, as a regulatory aspects that you really want to change to make this um, rollout of technology a bit easier? Um, or is there any other aspect in medical mix reality that you look most forward to? You're very welcome to answer whichever aspect you prefer. Perhaps we start with Bruce. You know, my ideal, uh, as a doctor, my ideal mixed reality device looks like a stethoscope. When I put the stethoscope on, I say, I just want to listen to your heart. I don't ask myself, like, what's the gain? What's the bandwidth? Uh, you know, uh, do I have like the right kind of uh, earbuds put in or anything? I just put my stethoscope on and listen to my patient. And we, we need this to be that way for our patients. We want it to be like when doctor says, let's take a look, they put on their whatever, and they're just looking and all of this other stuff that we're talking about today fades into the background. And the doctor just has this intimate relationship with their patient that they could not get any other way. And you don't have to, to become that on your screen. With you don't need to log in. <laughs> Great, Jennifer. Jennifer, what is your? So I I agree. Something um, smaller, lighter, more portable, less intrusive, and that that is a perceived less of a barrier between the physician and the patient. I mean, for my use case, it's pretty. You know, it's not that bad. My patients asleep on the table; they can't see when I put the headset on. But I do think that, you know, I don't think these are that far away. They're not going to be you know, quite as fashionable, but I do think that something that is more akin to a pair of glasses as opposed to um, a big headset is not that far away and I think will be more usable, not just during procedures, but during more regular courses of interactions with patients. And that's where I think we're going to start seeing some really interesting things developed. Thank you very much. Um, Christopher, do you want to comment on that? So I'd say my ideal AR device uh, would be course smaller lighter uh, but also reliable and I think what's also important my ideal AR device is powerful as a standalone device um, because I'm active in so many countries in so many different settings with operating rooms with and without wi-fi so ideally for me the uh, augmented reality device is in itself capable of uh, very high performance computations thank you very much and Thomas where are you in five years with your whole Insta? 
or you are a Hovind's wife. I don't know. What yeah. You know, everything that has been said is, is completely true. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are using uh, mixed reality uh, every single uh, day uh, for all our surgery. And the, I can tell that the main limitation to date is the quality of the Wi-Fi. And we are waiting for the 5G. And I think it will transform things because it will ease the use of this technology. So uh, it's not five years, 10 years time, is a couple of months time. And uh, really, it will change things. Thank you very much. So I already so see that we have plenty of questions in the chat. And there will be now, um, we have 30 more minutes in a different space though, where you will have uh, the possibility to um, address all these questions and directly um, talk to the speakers. I want to pull up one more quick announcement before I talk uh, about how we plan to have the interactive session. So first, first important announcement is especially important for people in Stanford and all the students who are watching right now and interested to do something in this space but perhaps don't have a headset. So at the Wood Science Institute, which is between engineering and the hospital, we now have a community mixed reality space, which is basically an open space where you also have a variety of headsets and mixed reality devices. Um, please just write me an email if you want to use it. It's very new. We don't yet have a website, but um, it's a great possibility for you to just try out some of this technology and perhaps come up with your own thing. And now I want to go to the next part. So the next half an hour, we'll have the interactive session. And this we will, won't be in Zoom, where we only have the possibility for one person at a time to ask a question. But we'll do it in Gather the Town, which, if you haven't used it so far, don't be put off by this cartoon environment. It actually works very well. So we have tested also um, at meetings before. It allows you to basically move around and then always talk to the people close to you. We'll have the speakers distributed in the four corners as you see um, in this image here. And if you go close to them, you will see it's, it's pretty self-explaining, easy to figure out. Once you go close to them, please raise your hands via um, either, I think, pressing number six or using this emoji here in the bottom corner, clicking on this emoji and raising your hand, and you can ask questions. Now, before you change the Getter Town, there are a few important things. If you have tried it before, it's probably easy um, for you to um, just go over there. If you haven't used it before, a few things to consider. First, uh, please be patient if it's your first time. Um, it, it will work, but you might have to click around a few times until you're in that space. Second thing, please use your first and last name so that people actually know who you are. It makes the networking much easier. Once you click on the link, so the link will now be in the chat. I'm not, I don't see the chat right now, but I believe um, Steffi will already have uh, pasted it there. In the chat will be the link to gather down. Once you click this link, it opens your browser and in the browser it asks you for microphone and camera access. Yes, please allow this, uh, the camera and microphone access. If you don't, you have to change your preferences in the browser it makes it a bit more complicated. Second thing, please leave Zoom once you enter Gather Town because we don't have, want to have feedback between Zoom and Gather Town. And you might not have camera access in Gather Town if you're still in Zoom meeting. And the third step, if you use it for the first time, if you haven't tried it out before, there might be a tutorial in the beginning. You can do it. You can skip it, um, your preference. Use the arrow keys to move, to move around. So it allows you to then move around and go towards the people that you want to talk to. Um, there are also a few shortcuts. Sometimes if you're stuck somewhere, you click G. It allows you to behave like a ghost to move through things. And like I said, use the emoji to um, ask questions. And now in the chat window, I think there are two links in the chat window, which unfortunately I don't see right now, but in the chat window, there's on the one hand, the one link to our website where you can um, sign up for the mailing list for future events. On the other hand, there's this bit.ly link. Just click that and then see you on the other side in Gathertown. Steffi, I think Steffi, if you show your video, Steffi will stay here in Zoom for any people who have problems. She'll try to answer any questions, guide you there as well as possible. All right, then see you in Gathertown. <laughs>